Coming up on Heartland Highways, we've been a lot of places and in this episode, we might have met our match. Photographer Bruce Wicks has taken pictures in over 1,000 area towns and often goes back several times to catalog how small town America and its landscape changes. We also visit the University of Illinois Pollinitarium. Don't know what that is? The Pollinitarium is a one-of-a-kind place dedicated to educating people about bees. Our final story has us meeting up with a group that collects what they call Breweriana, or anything related to beer. Stay tuned, you won't want to miss it. Heartland Highways is made possible in part by EIU's Academy of Lifelong Learning, providing all community members an outlet for their educational, social, and creative pursuits, opportunities to learn new skills, engage in topics of interest, and explore new areas of learning, available for people of all ages. More information available at 581-5114. Welcome back to Heartland Highways. I'm Lori Casey. And I'm Kate Pleasant. Now, Heartland Highways has been a lot of places, but in this episode, we might have met our match. Photographer Bruce Wicks has taken pictures in over 1,000 area towns and often goes back several times to catalog how small town America and its landscape changes. Here's his story. To many, he's known as the tourism guy an online handle that coincides with an image sharing social media site where he catalogs his thousands of photographs. But as I learned, Bruce Wicks is a self-taught photographer and retired professor from the University of Illinois that just likes to get out there. It's more of an obsession, I suppose, than anything else. I mean, you know, I was just reading the other day when you're retired, people that are happy and retired are still working in some way. And, you know, I said, you know, I'm still working on, on this project and, and there is no end to it. Uh, I just love getting out there. As I mentioned to you, I was just in Kentucky and Southern Indiana the past couple of days. So when the weather's nice and the sun's out and I can take pictures, I go. Bruce takes pictures of small towns. He started the project several years ago, never knowing it'd grow into what is pretty much a full-time job in his retirement. Well, it just started with, with taking pictures around Champaign County and, you know, then coming around here maybe to small towns. And once I took them, I had to keep going further and further and further. And now my trips are to South Dakota and Kentucky and Michigan and Wisconsin and just all over. And I just keep going further and further. Uh, and I'm getting pretty, pretty good at navigating my way around. and. Uh, and uh, going to these small, small and some larger communities. And there's a lot of, I've learned through, through Flickr, which is a social networking site for sharing images. Um, there's a lot of different groups and people collect pictures of, of all kinds of things. Uh, for example, um, well, courthouses, of course, that, that's a natural and I, I try to do them. Um, but there's a group on Flickr just for, um, small town barbershops that are in many ways slowly disappearing as people retire and more people go to uh, you know salons and more more uh, commercial type of type of places uh, one room schoolhouses I, I, I just can't tell you dairy queens I mean there's just so many groups and so I just keep trying to catch these things and record them uh, along with uh, certainly main streets are, are very, very important because, because they're losing them left and right uh, and b very old homes. So I'm interested in the architectural things in the community. Not that I'm a, an architect, uh, but I, I think I've, I've gained an eye for some of these uh, type of places. And, and I'll take pictures of things that are half fallen down and stuff just to get them before they're, before they're totally gone. Bruce has over 30,000 images from more than 700 towns in Illinois, 300 in Indiana, and several hundred in other states, totaling more than 1,500 towns visited. So what exactly is he photographing? 
the, the historic homes, the main streets, uh, and now the things like the, the Dairy Queens and the barber shops and uh, the courthouses and sometimes libraries if, if they're interesting. Uh, but I take pictures of other stuff too. I like old cars and old trucks and sometimes I see them, I stop. Oh, and uh, roadside memorials. I have taken photos of a couple hundred of them, which I find are uh, folk, so folk artsy, it's amazing. Um, unlike going to a cemetery, people put things on these, these memorials, and you've probably seen them on the side of the road, the white crosses and things like that. And, and oftentimes they're messages or they're things added to them, like a fishing reel or a hard hat or, or something like that that says something about the deceased person. And it, it's really kind of moving in many ways. And if we can, I try and go back and find the obituary and then link to it. Bruce says the work he's doing is important because cataloging small town history can often be overlooked and you can't turn back the clock. People will say, oh, thanks for taking that picture. I now live in Virginia and my uncle Harry owned that when that was a, our family hardware store. Or I grew up in that house and it's good to see it again. And so I get a lot of emails and things like that from people which are kind of rewarding. Um, but I think long term, the value is in, the value of each image gets greater as time goes on. As I said before, you can't turn the clock back. And if something happens to a community, like Gifford, I took pictures of Gifford before and I took pictures after. Uh, Sullivan was the same way. Uh, I was just down in Brookport yesterday. And uh, so, as I say, you can't, you can't go back and take and see what it looked like before something happened. A lot of people don't do what I do. They don't go out and take pictures of more mundane things. But uh, people just don't go out and do what I do. And that's why I think there's over a million and a half views um, of the type of things that I've, uh, I photograph because you can't find them anywhere else. So how does he decide where to go? Well, surprisingly, it's a lot more low-tech than you might think. Well, that's why I have these paper maps that I use. I have GPS and stuff in the car and, and all of that. That helps me find some things occasionally. But I, I use old-fashioned paper road maps, and, and I mark on them every town I've been to. Uh, either I circle it if I've taken pictures of it, or I put an X through it if there's nothing to see. I mean, there may be two old broken-down trailer homes and a couple old trucks, and that's all that's left in many of these towns are just place names anymore. Uh, but I have to record that so I don't go back and try and do it again. So uh, maintaining those maps, and because I can look at them in the car and I can get a big picture of things rather than a small picture of things. And uh, you know, I plan it out ahead of time before I go. And when he comes back, he spends hours upon hours cataloging, geographically tagging, and uploading his images to be shared with others, his views numbering over a million. But despite the effort it takes to get it all done, he says he doesn't see the end in sight. I'll do it till I don't feel like doing it. And I don't know how long that's gonna be. I just keep going further and further. And now I'm thinking about starting to go back to uh, some of the towns I went to originally where I probably didn't do as thorough a job as I would, I would do now. Cause I'm, my eye is different. I'm looking for different things. I'm picking things up. Uh, I think I have pretty good peripheral vision as I drive down the road. I can see things off to the side and things I'm looking for and, and all of a sudden I'll just stop and turn around and back to pick up something that I caught my eye. Did you know that more than just bees help pollinate the plants that grow around us every day? Well, in this story, we'll tell you all about pollinators as we visit the University of Illinois' Pollinitarium. Let's go see what the buzz is all about. The Pollinitarium is, it, it's the only uh, kind of structure of its kind in the USA. Um, it's like a museum that's dedicated wholly to pollination. And uh, so there are many kind of uh, different angles that this, is, this, this comes by. Um, from birds to, they, they, the most common one is honeybees, but then there, there are different kinds of bees that they go over, and then birds, and butterflies, and moths, and even bats. So uh, there's a lot of different things that are covered in here that aren't just 
honeybee related. It shows kind of how different the world of pollination can be when we tend to just think of it as bees flying around doing it. The pollinitarium on the campus of the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana was built around five years ago and was, ironically, once an empty building that housed chemicals that could harm the pollinators it now educates about. It was an empty building before uh, it became the pollinitarium and before that it was uh, actually a pesticide storage building. So it's really come full circle into becoming something that educates and, uh, educates about pollinators instead of something that uh, you know would be a harm to them. And uh, this was built uh, through a series of donations. Uh, May Berenbaum was in charge of uh, raising donations and she's still in charge of it today. And uh, she is also the head of our entomology department. So she played uh, the biggest role, I'd say, in getting this thing built. The Pollinitarium tells the story of pollination. Sounds simple, right? Like the story we probably all know? Well, according to Charlie, it's a much more complicated and important process than we might initially think. Pollination is, it's, it, it's how the plant reproduces. So the kind of the male part of the plant is picked up and carried to another plant that is the female part of the plant. And that's how they kind of, they keep from, uh, you know, uh, inbreeding and things like that. They have to mix with something that's far away and that's also how they would spread their genetics uh, to something that's farther away. So uh, without that, we, uh, we wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, when something is pollinated, that's also where the fruit comes from. So like, you know, if a tomato plant isn't pollinated by a bee, it doesn't produce a tomato. When a flower blooms, it's, uh, it's a lot more intricate than I guess you would assume. That uh, like, you know, if a flower, uh, uh, if everything bloomed at the same time, um, let's say the honeybee pollinating it could get confused and could pollinate a dandelion with an apple and uh, then you wouldn't get a dandelion, you know, you wouldn't get the, uh, the white head of a dandelion or an apple because they would both be confused with uh, the message that they got. So, you know, for example, the apple tree has to bloom at a specific time when all the other apple trees are blooming, and it also has to bloom at a time when the honeybee will be out flying around so it can pollinate it. So uh, this place kind of shows how that happens in, uh, in many, different, many different aspects, like the, um, the bat, which is, is right back here behind me, shows how uh, it flies across a desert and it pollinates a, um, it pollinates a cactus in the middle of the night. And the nectar that it gets from the cactus is its energy source for crossing this desert as it's, it's flying across it. So without the bat, the cactus wouldn't be able to reproduce because it wouldn't be able to spread its, uh, its pollen to another plant. And without the cactus, the bat wouldn't be able to cross the desert. So what the pollinitarium does is kind of, it shows what a, uh, a complicated system that we live in and how important each of these little tiny steps are in uh, the survival of many ecosystems, including our own. Pollination is also important when it comes to keeping variety on our plates, something else the pollinitarium teaches through its exhibits. Another thing that this place illustrates is how important this is to uh, human beings, that we, a lot of the food that we eat, and um, if, you, if you see a picture of the things, or a, a list of the things that are pollinated by, uh, that, that need to be pollinated by animals, um, it's kind of the more exciting parts of our meal. So if the pollinators were to disappear, we would be able to survive, we would just lose the delicious parts of our meal, it seems. The Pollinitarium works in conjunction with the University of Illinois Bee Research Facility, which conducts vast research on bees, all the way down to the genomic level. The Pollinitarium is open on weekends in the afternoon, and Charlie says there's always plenty to learn about pollination. The Pollinitarium is an interesting place because I think, you know, most people only think about honeybees uh, pollinating. And I know, you know, I mentioned uh, the, uh, the bat pollinating the cactus, and that's one that I talk about a lot because that's one that, you know, even if you do know about, you know, the bats feeding on this, this cactus nectar, uh, it's just, you don't realize how kind of intricate the system is and how, uh, you know, how, how various it can be, that there are moths that pollinate flowers at night, and there are all sorts of things that are working to keep, uh, you know, keep the flowers blooming and keep the system running that we don't 
really think about. So I think, you know, even if you think you know uh, quite a bit about pollination, you can come in here and you can always learn something. Next is a little history lesson about not the Heartland Highway, but the Dixie Highway. When it was completed in 1921, this series of improved roads connected Chicago to Miami. Here in Illinois, it was the longest continuous paved road in the state. Today's travelers along Illinois Route 1, just outside of Rossville, may have no idea that they're driving on a piece of transportation history. Long before the interstate system and even before Route 66, the Dixie Highway served as the first paved north-south route between Chicago and Miami. It was a series of paved roads that was a product of the Good Roads Movement. One of the Dixie Highway's biggest proponents was industrialist Carl Fisher. And Fisher had uh, land holdings near Miami, Florida. He also was involved in uh, a company called the Presto Light Manufacturing Company, which made uh, headlights for autos at that time. So he had an interest in making people drive, drive at night. He wanted to improve roads because the more roads were improved, the more people would buy cars. And he had also had an interest in getting uh, people down to Florida to hopefully buy or vacate, buy land or vacation down there to uh, help with his investments down there. In Illinois, the Dixie Highway comprised 136 miles with a starting point at Adams Street and Michigan Boulevard in Chicago. Leaving Chicago, the road followed Illinois Route 1 to Danville and then went west into Indiana. In October of 1915, a motorcade took off from Chicago in an effort to both promote and inspect the highway. They left Chicago about 6 o'clock that morning and didn't get to Danville until about 12 o'clock that evening. And up and down the road on their journey, they stopped in each community and basically the governor told the people why the Dixie, you know, the paved highways, in particular here the Dixie Highway was important to the state and their communities. By 1921, the entire route in Illinois was complete, making it the longest continuous paved road in the state. By 1926, the Dixie Highway was finished nationally, totaling nearly 5,800 miles. If you'd like to purchase a copy of any Heartland Highways program, contact us at 1-877-727-9348 during regular business hours. You can also visit our online store at weiu.net or mail in your order with payment to the address on your screen. DVDs are available for $25 each. Visa, MasterCard, Discover, or American Express are accepted. Just let us know what show you're interested in by mentioning the story name or person featured in the show. Well, you all know that Heartland Highways is no stranger to interesting collections. That's right, and our final story has us meeting up with a group that collects what they call Brewerania, or anything that's related to beer. And when we say anything, we mean anything. Take a look. <laughs> I've got boxes, I've got cans, I've got glasses, I've got bottles, I've got signs, I've got lighted signs, mirrors, uh, just a little bit of everything and you know it's just uh, whatever appeals to me and I guess to some degree whatever is uh, financially available. <laughs> My main interest is uh, what I consider Central Illinois breweries, primarily the ones that are no longer around, uh, dating back as far as possible, you know, pre-prohibition and so. And uh, so they're mostly from small towns in Central Illinois, uh, names most people haven't heard of. Geary and Kent are Central Illinois collectors of Breweriana or anything that has to do with beer. Always been a collector of something. Started out with coins like lots of kids did. And uh, up through college, uh, didn't collect too much. Didn't have the time for that. But then one night uh, living in a fraternity house, we had a big card game and associated uh, drinking going along with it and uh, next morning I cleaned up my room and found about six or eight different kinds of beer cans laying around on the floor. Just stuck them up on a shelf thinking, well, that's interesting, you know. 
And that's basically how it got started because everybody started looking at the cans and going, oh, well, I live up in the Chicago area and I, I drink this other kind up there and I'll bring you down one. So pretty soon my, my shelves started filling up and um, pretty much was hooked by then. I ended up filling up two shelves in my room and I didn't have enough room in the room to, to, to go with it. But uh, stayed with it and after I graduated, uh, got married and just continued collecting and expanded until 1973 when I joined the national organization called Beer Can Collectors of America and then it exploded. And, uh, and this is the result. That result spans a garage, room in his basement, and his very own man cave featuring items ranging from cans to advertising to beer bags from the pre-prohibition era and beyond. And it all started simple. Country Club Malt Liquor uh, was an eight ounce can that came out and uh, in the 60s they were promoting it pretty heavily in this area and you would get a beach towel with the purchase of a six pack of Country Club Malt Liquor and the towel was worth more than the beer. So uh, I got those, I've got uh, different Budweiser's, um, local stuff, fall staff, uh, Big Cat Malt Liquor, uh, Drury's Old Stock from uh, South Bend, Indiana. Just stuff that was local that I could get or that people, uh, fraternity brothers, would bring home from visiting home, you know, and they'd grab a six pack or something and give me a can of it. But what makes Breweriana so collectible? For me personally, the, the brewery it comes from is a big factor. Uh, then after that, uh, uh, eye appeal, obviously. So if it is a really neat graphics, that adds to it. Mm -hmm. But also the, just the, uh, I kind of, I collect it all, but I really like cardboard stuff, paper stuff, mm -hmm. because it pretty much was made to be disposable and uh, for it to survive after some of it, you know, 100 years and be in good enough shape to put up on the wall and, you know, really be attractive. That's, I think that's kind of neat that, you know, you'd love to know how it happened to survive a hundred years, you know. <laughs> I'm really attracted to advertising and I like colors. Uh, they kind of pop for me and uh, uh, the different kinds of advertising that are available are really what interests, interests me now. Um, I got into GB originally just because it's the initials of my name um, and it also happens to be the St. Louis area so it's readily available and was uh, uh, cheap enough that I could buy a few pieces from time to time. Old, neat, cheap, and local. Words to live by according to Kent. But with his interest in smaller breweries that have long since disappeared, that can sometimes be a challenge. You go anywhere you can to find it. Sometimes though, they actually, probably because they also were small and maybe still had limited advertising funds, the, the graphics really aren't that neat, but they're harder, you're scarcer and harder to find, so that makes them more attractive, even though they're not as pretty. <laughs> Gary and Kent both belong to local and national beer collector organizations. One that even holds a convention every year. While the breweriana is their passion, they say the people you meet along the way are a nice bonus too. We find this a very interesting hobby. We have a lot of fun with it and meet a lot of great people. Even if you go to a beer show, for instance, or uh, see somebody at a, an auction that collects a beer, it, it's, it's not about getting something there all the time as, as it is, uh, you know, talking to your friends and sharing stories about what you find, uh, you know, that sort of thing. I just enjoy it. I, I sometimes come down here and just pull up a chair and look around and go, okay, I wonder where I got that or what I paid for it or what I traded for it and, and what it's worth now having seen it on eBay or something, you know, and just kind of relish uh, the thought of having it all and enjoying it. Kent and Gary enjoy it so much, they say they wouldn't mind being surrounded by it all day long. At least if it were completely up to them. If 
I was living alone, I'd probably have my whole house directed uh, in Brewery Anna. I just like it's it's got a old original good quality Brewery Anna has really got a quality look to it. It's, it's just nice looking stuff. I have one advantage over Gary though. My wife allows me to display it all through the house as long as it meets her approval. You know, with well, the item. You know, but but we have like lithographs and. Uh, signage that we look at as a piece of art like somebody would put a picture up you know so those types of things she'll let me put up because she does it you know she uh, shares the interest in the hobby just not to the extent that i do but she's a collector herself so thanks again for coming along for our adventures on heartland highways if you have any ideas for us you can email them to heartlandhighways at weiu.net We'll see you next time. Heartland Highways is made possible in part by EIU's Academy of Lifelong Learning, providing all community members an outlet for their educational, social, and creative pursuits. Opportunities to learn new skills, engage in topics of interest, and explore new areas of learning. Available for people of all ages. More information available at 581-5114.